Okay, now I want to introduce hopefully some good stuff that you may or may not know about already. You know, we've been working on all the marine issues, the water quality issues, including the, the boxes, the many reefs that we have that have gone into our canals that are uh, Jean's pride and joy and great effort. And it's been going all the way from Anna Maria Island south. But we have a couple of people that have been very helpful and instrumental in being partners in the community. Um, we have two people. Right. And one of them you're going to meet today is um, Dave Wolf. I think Gene's going to tell you a little bit more about him, and he is the owner and producer of all of our mini reefs. And the other person is Megan Ehlers. I hope I say that name right. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Oh. <laughs> there you are. Okay, good. Because uh, Megan is involved in a wonderful program that's called the Carefree Learner Program. And the things that they do involve young people getting them involved in projects like this. And so many places have opened up their areas to allow access for small boats to get into areas. So they loan the boats, they make room for the boats, including Marina Jacks has done this. And she is with the Sarasota County School System. She has her PhD in Marine Sciences. She does all kinds of phenomenal work. And I hope that she will tell you some more about all of it. And let you know why we have some things to actually celebrate. So Megan, would you like to go ahead and start with what you have to share? Yes, I will. Can everybody hear me all right? Well, uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to speak today. I'm, I'm really excited. It was it happened because basically I, I met Paul on during one of my trips, and I, I think that we're gonna have a really great relationship. I'm looking forward to working with all of you guys. And just to give you a little bit of a background on myself, um, as she said, I have a, a bachelor's in marine science from Eckerd College, and then my master's and PhD is from the University of South Florida in science education. And I currently teach at Sarasota High School, and I've been teaching there for about 19 years. And I have the best job probably in the county, possibly in the state, because in the mornings I get to teach students at Sarasota High School marine science. I teach eighth marine science. And then in the afternoons, about 11 o'clock, I leave my classroom hop into my car and I get to hop onto the boat and do field trips with students in Sarasota County schools, adults, and in different community members. So before I start talking about the Carefree Learner Program, I have to give you guys a little bit of a background about a marine science program. It has grown quite a bit. I'll talk briefly in a second about the teachers and what we do in our classrooms, but we have five teachers currently, 19 classes, and over 500 students a year go through this program. So we have marine science regular and honors. Um, the eighth credits of ASNA are actually for college credits through University of Cambridge. And then we just started or will be starting next year an aquaculture program. So they're in the pictures you see there at the high school. And uh, that's kind of what our classrooms look like. We have a lot of aquariums so that we can bring things from Sarasota Bay back for observation. And uh, these are, you know, part of the team. Uh, Chris Booth on the left-hand side, he actually, he knows how to ride a, drive a helicopter. I should say fly a helicopter. Um, he's the more exciting one. It's a comedy show every day with him, but uh, he really does care about the students, and uh, he puts in 200% all the time. Sue Forrest in the middle. Not only is she a past scientist at Moat Marine, but she's a marine science teacher, and she does tours through Grand Classroom, which are basically international and sometimes in the United States tours related to education. And then finally, uh, Dr. Lewis Miranda, he is originally from the University of South Florida's College of Marine Science. He has a PhD in chemical oceanography, which is very helpful. I know that you have been working with a YSI and I always, when I need calibration and things like that, I'm turning to uh, Dr. Miranda. And then finally, a huge addition this year, we stole her for Moat Marine. Christina Young is going to start our aquaculture program next year. And uh, you'll see in a second some of the animals that we bring back to the classroom. And she's going to be creating live feed for a lot of these species. So we'll be able to kind of increase the diversity. She also is going to provide some of it towards probably Moat Marine still, and also, you know, Riverview that is growing things for aquaculture and anything that might need those little guys. But you can see right there, she's uh, suctioning in the shark tank at Moat Marine. She's still very much involved over there and loves it. So this is a picture of our boat. It is Sarasota High School's floating classroom, and it was built by students in 1978 with help from the community members. But uh, we take it out on biweekly field trips. 
And when I say we take it out, the teachers and we have a captain who I'll introduce in a second. All of the teachers in the marine science program, we drive buses. We are better teachers than bus drivers, but that's how we get the students to and from the school within one class period. This is Randall Patterson, our captain. He's a certified coastal naturalist. He's, he used to be in law. Um, he was actually in environmental law and he's an avid birder. And if you ever have been on the boat with me when I do adult trips, he's usually the person that's going to be talking about the Roberts Bay bird rookery and those species. So he's a great person to have as part of the team because he has, you know, that extra stuff. So what it looks like when we go out in the boat with our students is again, these are weeks, these are trips every other week. The students go out there and do water quality samples. We do have a YSI that we just got through Sarasota Bay Estuary Programs on Bay Partners Grant. But even with that, we would probably still have the students doing some hands-on water quality, just the, the salinity, the pH, and so on. And then they do population sampling. So we have a really large otter trial net that you can see on the upper right-hand corner, students pulling up. And um, I have an endorsement through the state of Florida that allows us to do that near seagrass beds. So it's an educational permit. Anything that I take out of the bay has to be put back in within 30 days, but everything that we take out, we put back in within about two weeks. And so once we pull up that net, um, there's a bin that each group of students get and they start sorting through it. And you can see the picture on the bottom right-hand corner, a lot of seaweed, especially this time of year. And then they can start looking at a lot of the different uh, biodiversity, the fish, the invertebrates, and that kind of leads me to the iNaturalist app. So once we get on the boat and we collect these organisms, we want to do something with that information. And what I've kind of moved towards over the past few years is using iNaturalist because it's easy for the students, the community members can be involved. And we actually have some support from us scientists and people that really know about these species. So if you were interested in being part of this and possibly identifying some of the things that we're pulling up on the boat, you could even join the Carefree Learner Sampling page and start seeing some of the pictures the students are doing. So as we pull it up, they measure the organism, they take a picture, and then it's uploaded and it registers the location of where they were caught in the bay. And it's, you know, it's a, close to the location. Um, and then once that picture is up there, the students can go back and we have ID books for identification or sometimes, as I said, the community members are going to do it. And then kind of tying that into the classroom, obviously we're driven by content um, and our learning outcomes and standards. And I have a couple of, you know, very small on the left-hand side of what specifically for the ACE Marine Science curriculum, how perfect it kind of fits in. But I think with any marine science content area, we're looking at an opportunity to talk a lot about sustainable fisheries, for instance, the stone crab fishery, you can see that little guy right there. Um, seahorses and breeding, we've had a lot of pregnant seahorses sometimes even give birth in the classroom. And then we do things like biological drawings. Taxonomy is pretty huge. Again, kind of bringing those back and taking the time to observe the different characteristics really gives the students kind of a, an exciting way to introduce that stuff. Obviously it's going to be engaging going out in the boat in general, but this really allows us to easily start talking about, you know, those other areas. So that's pretty much just the Sarasota High School Marine Science students. It's just high school, but in the afternoons for the second part of my job, I'm usually going to be on the boat with seventh graders. And uh, thanks to Sarasota County Schools and because the students built the boat, the trip is completely free for the public school students that are seventh graders. So that means transportation, the trip, and uh, everybody gets the opportunity to go on it. So we're talking about 3000 students per year. In addition to that, public, private charter schools. Um, we've had some homeschool groups come on. We're pretty much open to anybody that's a nonprofit. And leading into that, we have a lot of community members that support the program. So I have two of them highlighted in yellow. Sarasota Shell Club, if you haven't heard about it, it's a really, really, well, an Inglewood Shell Club. It's a pretty neat program, both of them, where people go out and collect shells. Um, we take them to very shallow areas during low tides for collections. And then in March, well, I should say in February, they have a shell show where they create art or they do identification. I believe that Sarasota Shell Club has actually identified specific or new species for about over a thousand different um, gastropods and bivalves and things like that. There are a lot of scientists, um, professors that are emeritus of marine science that are involved in that. 
And then uh, the American Littoral Society, which is, uh, we go out on trips with them every Thursday from one to three. And the donations that they get, they give straight to us to support the program. But otherwise, uh, Inglewood Shell Club, we've got with Audubon Society for the Robert State Bird Rookery. That's also part of the American Littoral Society trip. But if you haven't been to the Robert State Bird Rookery, I'm sure you guys have. Um, one of the most successful bird rookeries in the state of Florida. And right now, recently, uh, if you haven't been out there in the next last year or so, we have an amazing population of the rosy at Spoonbills. It's really just, it's exploding right now. And then the other things that we do are community events. We recently just did the seagrass survey with Sarasota Bay Estuary Program and Sarasota County Government, where we take community members out on the Carefree Learner. They snorkel, um, look at the different species of seagrass, look at the different percent coverage in different areas. And then hopefully, again, everything was slightly paused during COVID, but we used to do the clam hunt with Sarasota Baywatch. Um, Audubon monofilament cleanup, the only time you can go on the Robert State Bird Rookery is when it's not nesting season. So usually we take students or adults out there in October to do that and to clean up all that monofilament line. I know a few years ago when we did it, our students found three dead pelicans on one piece of fishing line. So it's really an important um, piece of stewardship that we do. And then just the cleaning up of Edwards Island, removing invasive species, which has now become more of a focus, and then planting native species. So that's the, the fun field trip and community part of the job. And the other thing that I do is I write grants to work with uh, teachers for professional development. And I do this with Sarasota County Schools. One of the women I work with is uh, Dr. Sarah Burkett. She is the science program specialist for high school. And we worked on the Sarasota Watershed Learning Lab for two years, a cohort of about 35 teachers, middle and high school science teachers, where basically we had a summer institute that was three days. Sarasota Bastry program and our other partners would teach the teachers during the morning about you know, relevant environmental impacts or issues that were happening. And then in the afternoons, we'd all get together and collaborate to kind of integrate that into the curriculum. So the lesson plans uh, for for the teachers for that upcoming year. And that was all funded through the NOAA Bay Watershed Be Wet program, which focuses on watershed education. So we use those lesson plans to kind of drive everything. And a huge component of that was the teachers not only had to do lesson plans, but create watershed experiences, field experiences for their students to get them out into you know, the watershed in some way, either celery fields, maybe out on the bay with me, something with theirs in the Bay Estuary program. Um, it, was a, it was a great program. So they got paid and they got a lot of professional development hours. What we are currently working on right now, uh, we just received a grant, Sarah Burkett and Andrew Hartsman, who is my science department head at Sarasota High School, to the Gulf Research Program. And it was on environmental justice. We've just started planning that right now. It's going to go for two years. Kind of similar, we'll have two cohorts of teachers. This first year, it's just going to be science teachers over at Sarasota High School, and we're going to identify environmental justice issues in the county and have the students collect data and research it. And that's kind of quick, but that's pretty much it. Thank you, you guys have any questions? Megan, um, is there a way for uh, a general public to join some of your tours? Well, I used to be able to have observers. That's a little bit iffy now. You actually have to go through the volunteer program through Sarasota County Schools. And if you, anybody was interested in volunteering, that would be fine too. Otherwise, the American Littoral Society trip, like I said, during the spring from 1 to 3 p.m., we do those pretty much every single Thursday. Or any nonprofit could contact me and book me with a donation. And I'm very, very flexible if you guys were interested in that. And of course, if your group wanted to go out, I think we've talked about it someday. We have to get you guys out. <laughs> no, we, we, we definitely could be interested in that. Um, I also know that you do a program. Don't you do a, another program out of Marina Jacks on the weekend or something? We do not. Okay. But I do have to uh, thank you for mentioning Marina Jack. Uh, they actually give us our slip for free. We have a 99-year lease because the students built the boat. So that's, they're huge supporters. Well, I want to say thank you very much. And we definitely will talk to you about setting up a non -pro Got a hand out here. Go ahead. How can you contribute to this? Um, Did you hear the question? How can you, how can people contribute to this program? Um, well, volunteering would be huge. If you wanted to come with me on some of the middle school trips, if you wanted to make a monetary donation, 
just um, sending it to Sarasota High School Care for Your Learner program. Um, again, booking us for nonprofit trips or any activities, community events. We love to show up and do that so people get a little bit, um, I mean, it's, it's very difficult for us to get more people as part of our program because the hours that we do it are so limited. So we're always up to, to booking anything new and we appreciate the support. So can we put that information for people to link to it? Would you mind if we did that? In other words, yeah. good. If you yeah, I can do it. I can provide uh, the website and information on it. Yeah. Um, Joyce has a question too. Um, I know that um, when you take the students out and they <clears throat> and they look at they collect uh, the sea life and things. Does that information go into a, a like a central database? Yes. And actually, if you go on iNaturalist, I'm going to go back a little bit so you can see it again. I have the website right there, but my email is, is carefreelearner at gmail.com. Jean has my contact information. But anyone can join that project and look at the observations the students have done. And then and participate by identification. And then as a follow-up, does the county on a regular basis do a similar type of sampling and put that into a central database? I don't believe that they do. Um, I There has been, you know, different Sarasota Bay focused population studies. Um, I've seen one, I don't know of anything recently. But I mean, we go out there almost, well, I should say that during our middle school trips, we don't really do any quantification or we don't do any ID besides me just kind of talking about the different organism that takes a lot of planning and a lot of practice. We have been kind of working with getting some of the middle school groups to do that. But either way, the fact that we go out every other week five times and do this, um, it's a lot of data. And this may not be the best way for it to be presented or to be shared. And I'm always open to different things. I've been thinking about it for years at this point. Yeah. Um, David Wolf is the next guest speaker. David is the owner of Ocean Habitats, which creates the mini reefs that we've been putting into our uh, canal and around CSD Key waters. Um, as you can tell, he's traveled around 42 countries. He's looked at this as being one way that helps him understand people and understand work with different backgrounds. He grew up in Southwest Florida, attended the University of South Florida, Florida, and became a marine biologist. He uh, also procured today's mini reef um, when he was working on Sanibel Island, and it was called the Habitat at that time. Um, right now, when funds dried up, he went in a different direction, and he took on real estate. Everybody knows how that works. And he did pretty well with that. But then he decided to come back and operate um, and it always had the love of the water. So David created the Ocean Habitat Company, a nonprofit as well. And his mission is to bring coastal uh, waters to life again. And we've got over 5,000 mini reefs installed in Florida around the state from Key West to the uh, east side up to Fort Lauderdale and then all the way around up to Anamarie Island, Tampa. Um, so we're really working on trying to get more in our waters. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, David. Yeah, hello. I'm Dr. David Wolf. Um, it's it said in the agenda that I have a PhD. I, I actually have a uh, doctorate in divinity. I'm a minister, so that's why I'm Dr. Wolf. But um, didn't have to go to quite as much school for that. Uh, but here is a, a picture down the keys of one of our mini reefs. Um, Looks like a very simple device, kind of like a parking garage with a big roof. Uh, and it was developed originally to replicate uh, first mangrove tree prop root environments. Uh, but also, we, over time, we, we figured out that it also did a pretty good job of replicating uh, saltwater marsh grasses. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of artificial reef programs all around the world. 99% um, of them are have to do with uh, sinking ships or um, when bridges are being torn down, you know, dumping them off and, and making offshore and making a, an artificial reef to, you know, congregate adult fish. Uh, but that there's really nothing was being done at the time um, to talk about, well, where do fish grow up? Because like here in the state of Florida alone, 
we've lost over 50% of our wetlands to development over the last 145 years. And with half of our wetlands gone, it's one of the reasons why we've had, you know, re reduction in fish populations um, and some of the water quality problems we have. Obviously lots of us here aid with some of those things too. Um, so we thought, hey, you know, why not, why not put together a program where we can use things like the wasted space underneath docks to produce more life and help restock our, our coastal waters. Um, you can go to the next slide. So, you know, our, our mission was to replicate this. Um, this particular picture uh, doesn't have tons of growth on it, but uh, these mangrove trees normally in prehistory in Florida were, were basically the kidney system of uh, your coastal waterways. All the filter feeding animals, so all your oysters, uh, mussels, sea squirts, things like that, um, grow all over these, uh, these prop roots to keep the trees up. And all they do all day long is pull water in, scrape all the sickle cell organisms out of it, and then push clean water essentially back out. Uh, obviously they don't filter everything in the water, but they, they get a lot of the, the things that we have problems with blooming in great uh, quantities out of the water. But we're missing a lot of them. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, this is the second reason why mangroves are important. Um, they are the nursery habitat to most of the fish that uh, you're gonna see in the waterways around Florida. Um, all of the commercially viable fish uh, that we get here, I should say all, it's about 95%. Uh, start their life right here in uh, mangrove trees, as well as your shrimp, crabs, uh, spiny lobsters. All these animals grow up here to a certain life stage, and then they head offshore, or they stay, ne stay near shore, but they're out in the seagrass beds, etc. cetera, um, once they're larger, faster, and smarter, so they can survive better. Um, we thought this would be a fairly uh, simple um, idea to complete. People had ideas like this since the 1950s. There was quite a few universities that worked on different ideas around this subject. The person who actually hired me uh, had been working on it since he graduated New College uh, in the 19, like early 80s. And you know, he put about 12 years into it and just kind of kept hitting uh, the brick wall uh, of the units didn't only work for a short period of time, they broke and fell apart. You know, it was, it was, it was one problem after another. I can do the next slide. So um, I came on board. Uh, first, I went to college to be an aerospace engineering uh, engineer. Um, mathematics was big to me. Uh, however, that particular uh, industry was condensing and laying off 65% uh, of the workers across the country. And I decided it was really bad to go get a $120,000 education in a field that it's going to be hard to get work in. So um, it was my excuse to tell my parents, I want to be a marine biologist and not have them laugh about it. I had like good reasoning behind it. So when I came on board, the testing processes that we were using um, out on Sanibel were really slow. Um, it, it does take nine months to a year when you put something in the water to figure out what you've got. Um, but the scientists who were working on it were kind of doing one idea at a time and waiting a year. And they couldn't figure out why it had been 12 years and they hadn't quite got anywhere yet. So... Uh, I instituted, you know, how many ideas do you have? You know, if there's 14 of them, then we're going to build all 14 ideas. If you have eight different materials you're thinking about using, we're going to build eight of each one, and we're going to put them all out at once, and we're going to find out what happens. So in about a year and a half, we blew through these, these pages of ideas and got down to a unit that we started calling the habitat that actually functioned pretty close to nature. Um, it was able to go multi-year. Um, it didn't decrease in performance, that type of thing while we were doing that. Um, and so the last thing we had to do then, because people are going to ask, is to like kind of quantitate all of the, uh, the numbers that, that uh, these units can do, like how many fish did they produce, how many crabs, how much water did they filter. So this is a picture of an experiment uh, in, a, in a marina on Sanibel. There's a control on the left and uh, the experimental on the right. There's uh, back in those days, we just saved money. We used uh, big crab trap buoys uh, to float the units. And what we would do is you can't see it in this picture, but there are vinyl curtains that go down to the bottom um, from these booms. And we have water depth uh, measurements. So we know exactly how, how many gallons of water uh, are contained within um, each one of those. There is nothing but an aerator running in each one because since they are um, 
cut off from the surrounding water. We wanted to make sure there weren't any oxygen issues, that type of thing, especially for the habitat. Uh, we would then time it to see how long it took to um, clear the water. You can do the next slide. And in about seven hours, we went from the surrounding water having about 12 inches of visibility to there's a seeing eye chart down at the bottom, uh, seven feet deep, you know, and you can, there's a little bit of refraction there, but you can read it pretty, pretty easily on there. Uh, we repeated this, this process multiple times. Uh, we also brought uh, other habitats in that had different life growing on them to see if we get different results um, so that we could, we could kind of quantitate everything. We took units out of the water. We completely stripped them down of life. We counted everything on them. Um, thankfully, I didn't have to do that myself. There was dozens of people there, but the average habitat had about 150,000 organisms living on it. Obviously, most of those were extremely small. Um, you know, there would be uh, 10,000, you know, just amphipods living on it, which look kind of like weird little shrimp, but they're kind of the cows of the ocean. They eat the waste products of all of these filter feeders. Um, they're also a food source for a lot of the, the juvenile fish and crabs um, crawling around in the habitat. I need the next slide. And we kept scaling it up. We're saying, well, hey, is it, will it, will it if we put enough habitat in there, we'll just keep clearing it no matter what we do. Um, you have to excuse the old grainy pictures from the 90s, but the disposable cameras weren't that great back then, I guess. Uh, next slide. So this was the biggest one we ever did. This is a 50,000 gallon um, enclosure. And we could clear this, you know, in about 20 hours, you know, the, the numbers kept holding up. The numbers we got from what we stripped off the habitats and, and the known filtration rates of those animals also equaled about 99% um, correlation with what we were measuring time-wise in the water. Now, these booms are actually uh, 30 feet long. And after we would run an experiment of, of clearing the one on the right there, we'd get in the water. I couldn't find any of the pictures. A lot of things were lost in Hurricane Charlie when someone's roof came off their house and their computer was destroyed. So, uh, but you could sit on this, this bottom corner and look all the way to the corner of the side we had produced, you know, diagonally there about 34 feet of visibility in a canal that had maybe 18 inches. So these animals are am, animals are phenomenal in what they can do, um, and you know, it's it's just their job. They they eat 24 hours a day. Do next slide. And uh, I I have a, a few pretty photos of what things look like underwater because it is a bit hard to see when you're just looking down from a dock. Uh, here's a, a close-up of a, of a sandy sea squirt. Um, and this is, the, this is the unit that has developed for a while. Uh, what you get is a lot of different animals live together. So while well, you can see the two siphons, these little black holes, um, and you can see kind of a, a tan color, it looks like it changes to more of a, like a, a green gray. And then you can see more of it going up on, on top of there. And... Those are actually a relative. They're called ascidians. They, they grow as a colony. They're very, very small compared to the sea squirt here, but they live all over the outside of its body. And so you have like multiple animals in the same area feeding on the local um, water passing by. It's a little hard to see in this photo, but there are um, some feather duster worms. There's also some young anemones uh, growing out of there, but you know, just gives you an idea of, of what some of these guys look like. Um, next slide. Same thing here, um, another sandy sea squirt. It's a very common sea squirt in Southwest Florida. They grow on our, on our many reefs anywhere where the water is salty enough. And uh, you, know, you get the same overlapping life living on top of each other. Uh, there'll be barnacles buried in all this. You'll, you'll see their fans come out while they're feeding. You know, anything where there isn't gonna be any motion on the animals, another animal grows right on top of them. Uh, next photo. So this is a mini reef that's been in the water. This is in Marco Island. Uh, it had been there about three years uh, when I took this. It has a lot of macroalgae growing off the top of it. It's fairly common if there's any sunlight hitting the area. Uh, it's nice to have that. Uh, you get a lot of uh, small fish that love to live in that. There's food in there and there's a lot of safety. Shrimp love it. Uh, seahorses grow up in there. Uh, we find them all the time uh, when we're examining a unit. Uh, you can see that even the lines that attach the unit to the dock become covered in life. 
Uh, and this particular property here is a good example of this person bought one and then bought another one the next year, another one the next year. I think the fourth year we went back, he asked to just fill in the whole dock because he wanted them all look, to look like this. He couldn't believe how many fish he had um, living around his dock because you do a really good job of internally setting up a, a food chain where there is food for the base of the food chain. And then that base of the food chain is, is for the young uh, crustaceans and fish. Um, but also you get like mangrove snapper, for instance, the, when they're still small, they're too big to get in the unit, but they like to hang out underneath of it. And because they're there, they're a favorite food source for most of the fish that we go fishing for. So then you end up with whatever is you know, local in your area coming by your dock all the time. And in some cases where we have a large number of units, if there's enough water depth, you even get porpoises and dolphins that come in and um, will fish off of these. So if they're in a long row, um, I've watched there'll be two or three dolphins together. One of them will head underneath the units along the dock and it'll flap its tail so that um, the units bounce in the water and scares all the fish out. And then their buddies coming down the outside will get some food and they circle back around. And the one that they went under first stays outside. Somebody else takes a turn going under and they keep fishing that way until they're hungry or something else attracts them and they, and they wander off. So um, it's, it's, it's pretty neat um, what ends up um, developing around these units um, as they age. It does take about three years for them to fully develop. Um, they hit all their numbers that we talk about, which is 30,000 gallons of water a day filtered on average uh, and 500 um, fish shrimp uh, and um, uh, crabs will grow up, grow up to not maturity, but they're post-juvenile. They're looking for adult habitats. So they drop off and leave and then they get replaced the next year by the new spawn that comes in. But the actual filter feeders and everybody who's on here, that changes over time. When you get to around three or four years, you get to like your stable community who, who's going to be on there. It's called a climax community. And they're usually there then for the long run, whatever their lifespans are. All right, uh, next photo. Um, here's a good shot of the outside of a unit underwater. Um, there are probably 45 or 50 species of filter feeding animals um, living on this unit. It's inside where you can't really see, where everybody's, it's dark and protected. It's gonna be full of, of shrimp, crabs, and fish. Uh, next slide. And this is actually one of our, our first units when I restarted this. I started off with the float balls again because we only had a few thousand dollars in donations to get going with. Um, so there, there's no giant float top like we have today. So I was able to actually take a photo top down in a unit. This is one, this was about a year old. This is also Marco Island. And again, you can see you know, all the different colors. A lot of people start thinking they have coral growing. It's not coral, it's, it's, it's different, uh, um, especially ascidians, they come in a lot of colors. Um, again, you can see them uh, overlapping each other. Um, and you just end up with like a forest of life uh, inside the mini reef. It, it, it replicates what mangrove trees do. Um, very well. Um, we had 105 failed models before we finally got to what worked perfectly. Uh, I was on, I think, number 94 when I restarted this. So we had another 10 to go or so before we, we got it right. But um, because of the design, actually, the, the, the dimensions inside of it matter, the size of it, the shape of it, all of it's very important. Um, almost all these animals, they have spatial requirements. If an area is too tight or too uh, open, they either won't live there or they'll be killed there. They, they won't be able to survive. Um, so the mini reef is able to pack a lot more life into its area than like a mangrove tree could normally. Um, in fact, the amount of, of uh, surface area that's inside of a mini reef is the same as if you look at a seawall, there's usually about a six, seven, eight inch um, kind of life zone along it. Above that, it's out of the water too long during the day, low tide, so uh, nothing grows up there. And below that, there's, there's no food. And in the summer months when it's hot, there can be no oxygen as well down there. That's another reason why the mini reef floats. Um, this will, will equal about 125 feet of seawall in surface area for that, just for that life zone, not outside of it. Um, and then final slide. And then this is, you know, the, the secondary thing that it does that, that, uh, food chain we talked about, you get all these, these um, they're, they're post-juvenile, but they're still small snappers. 
um, there could be clouds. This is at a, a, a restaurant, actually. There could be clouds of, of hundreds of fish underneath of some of like a, a large group of habitats. They're just everywhere. They, they use the habitats actually for safety when bigger fish do come in after them. Um, they, they school around them. They, they keep the reefs between themselves and the predators. Um, it, it's really fascinating to watch. So, you know, I'm super happy that, that uh, the mini reef has been the success that it's been. You know, we're going to continue to work on getting into more countries, uh, more states. Uh, you know, you can find mini reefs from Key Biscayne in, in Miami all the way up to Maine. They're all along the Gulf Coast, and there are several places in California. Uh, even um, some people are putting them in in, in Puget Sound. Um, I haven't heard back from them yet, though, how it's been going. Um, you know, they, they work wherever. It's just whatever's local is, is what uses them. And uh, the fun part for me is that I'm still young enough to work on this for a while. And the mini reef is only one of 35 designs that we were working on. Some are specifically to grow a stone crab or spiny lobster. That's all they do. They, they get the same kind of filter feeding animals growing on them, but they're, uh, the way they're, they're shaped, um, they can congregate those animals. So there's, op there's still opportunity for ocean ranching ideas that we had in the beginning. We also have much larger units that um, can produce thousands of, of commercially viable um, you know, seafood, whether it's crabs or lobsters or fish, it depends. And we're going to be starting to look into getting into some of those fields to see if we can't um, get life out into the ocean at, at higher rates. So that's all I have is talking all about me and our work. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Well, the question was about manatees and are they still starving in our bay and how are they doing? We did have, when we've gone out on the boat recently, we had manatees mating in the Sandies. We're Sandy Beach, Sandy Cove. We had a pair of manatees mating in there. There have been many manatee uh, mothers with babies that have been coming in and they are eating the mangrove leaves. There is not really enough food. Now, they are, you know that we're feeding them and that's what's happening. So we do have to work on our seagrasses and uh, doing other things. Um, we're looking at some things with our group to look at food. And I'll, I will talk about that. But right now, I still think we have a problem. Uh, Dave, would you want to comment on that at all? Well, yeah, the, the problem is seagrass beds are 60, 70% gone in most of Florida. Um, they're, they're buried by all of the algae in the water. There's not enough, not enough sunlight for them to live on. Um, they're a plant, they need light. And it's dark down there. So they all, there's also this constant rain of detritus that's kicked up by boats um, and storms when they come through. And it's all this rotting material that's on the bottom. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, it can be leaf clippings. Um, it, a lot of things that come from us. There's a lot of things that's just, you know, leaf, leaf litter from mangroves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that detrit that like kind of like it's like a detritus rain that's that's found all over inner bays um, when they're churned up um that gives seagrass a lot of trouble um that that causes a lot of problems for oyster beds uh clams um these animals are literally buried alive um and, and suffocate and die so that's why we've had such a huge reduction in a lot of different things seagrasses you know oyster beds that type of thing loss of clams uh, in bays um, and it's, it's a, it's a problem that's hard to fix and, and has to be addressed because, you know, the seagrass is not going to grow back on its own with what's currently going on. Right. We're going to also be talking, more people are asking us, what can we do next? One of the things we can do if you're on the water is to collect your grass clippings, have your, your, uh, your person who does the lawn, collect them rather than blowing them into the water. I mean, that, when you get the runoff too, that's the other problem is we're, so we're looking at some solutions we can talk to people about considering. So to make the next level, make the next improvement. Right. One thing that would really help, because this is rarely brought up, um, especially at uh, universities and research centers. Um, one of the extremely limiting nutrients in the water for anything to grow as far as when we talk about cyanobacteria or um, you know, different kinds of uh, um, allergies, et cetera, phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, that whole chain uh, in, in the state of Florida, iron is very um, deficient in the water. And without iron, 
most of these animals cannot form a shell and therefore they can't reproduce. The only iron that used to be um, prevalent in the water, the only source was actually the Sahara dust storms. They come across the Atlantic. You know, people who lived in Florida long enough, you know, it's like you come out and your car's got you know, this red dust all over it. It's actually from the Sahara Desert and it's full of, of iron ore. Um, so that was kind of like what fed red tides and things like that traditionally before we were here. But now you have things like brake dust. Um, so the, the runoff from, from roadways um, pumps a lot of, of iron out into the water. Um, your rooftops collect that same dust from, from uh, the Sahara when it, when it does come over uh, periodically. And when I, when I see like a lot of people, they, they don't want to have like a wet yard or something. So they'll, they'll put a hose all the way out to the canal and dump the water off their roof right into the canal. You know, you're just dumping straight food into it is all you're doing. Um, you know, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're helping these like super cycles of, of algae growth to happen. And, you know, that's, that's something if people would just put in some, put in a, uh, uh, like a sump in their yard where water can be put to slowly filter down through the limestone before it gets out to the canal, you know, and, and the iron can be left behind in your lawn, your lawn will use it. And that's no problem with that. Um, that actually would help a lot too. You know, you could ban lots of fertilizer, um, all the fertilizer, but if, if iron got in there, well, then you'd still have algae blooms. Like that's like a limiting, that's one of the two main limiting factors that have to come in in some rain event to get things going. David, thank you. Welcome. This is pretty exciting stuff. And uh, many of you know that uh, the Key Association uh, did initiate our own uh, true charitable fund, which is the, the Siesta Key Environmental Defense Fund. So we have been using donations that have come to that to help purchase equipment that we're using for water testing as part of this project in the canals. And uh, recently we did have a, a very kind, one of our members um, donate an underwater, uh, it's almost like a submarine camera. It goes away from you and it can be directed by an app on your phone. Now, I don't think any of us yet know how to use that, <laughs> but I hear you can get trained in a swimming pool. So that's a good start. And uh, he's probably listening on here right now. So thank you so much, Michael. And we, we know we really appreciate it. But if you do uh, want to make any contributions to things that further this work, just know that the partnership of what this project has been for us is funded in part by the things that we can get donations for to purchase a camera, for example, to do underwater photos of what's developing, to do further research, and also for chemistry testing, which we send someone to do from the water sampling. So, just think of us when you can. Thank you so much. And thank you all. This has been a great presentation. Good. I learned a lot of good, good. stuff. Yeah. Thank Super. you, Jean, for arranging this. Yep. It's wonderful. And I think we just have a couple more things that we will do today because we've had a lot to talk about today. More, than, I mean, we should have expected that, and we did actually, but I'm glad everybody had a chance to say some of the things we did at the beginning. All right. Um, while Bob gets ready, I'm just yeah. going to say uh, we're taking orders now for mini reefs for our June, July install. We've got over 200. This chart down here shows the installs is a little behind. It was done in uh, April, early April. And basically here's the kind of water data we're collecting. We're getting inventory and we're testing this, the salinity, the turbidity, the pH levels, dissolved oxygen. Those are the things we're testing. And then the other thing that's really important is colonization. We're trying to understand the diversity and the colonies of fish we're getting. Juvenile fish are coming. We're actually getting there. So um, basically, we're going to continue to work on habitat, partnerships, and expanding our service and educating our community. So thank you very much for giving us the time.